Hello, students, and welcome to week three. We're uh, setting a pace now and moving right along, and I appreciate your open, robust participation in our course. I have thoroughly enjoyed our live session last week. For those of you that could not be with us, we missed you. I do hope that you've taken time to look at the recording from that session so that you can be on the same page with the rest of us, but um, we're setting into a, settling into a good rhythm now, and I just appreciate everything that you're doing in our course. As we begin week three, I wanted to take a few moments to review a few things from week two. Uh, we had some major assignments last week, two parts. First, I want to talk about the readings quizzes. As I had told you last week in our live session, uh, the week two readings quiz was going to have multiple attempts with a time limit of 60 minutes. I had to go in and reset the uh, uh, the details for that quiz so that that was the case. I didn't want to mislead you. I didn't want to deprive you of any opportunity to do your best work. Moving forward, future readings quizzes, and they come up again in week four and in week six and in week eight covering two weeks at a time. Week four will cover the course material readings from weeks three and four. Week six will be weeks five and six. Week eight will be weeks seven and eight. Uh, each of those upcoming quizzes will be taken one time with no time limit. Now, that's how they were originally set, but when I told you before that there was going to be multiple attempts with a time limit, I wanted to make good on that. So in upcoming quizzes, you're going to be able to leave and return freely. Uh, there's no time limit. But each time you do leave, if you choose to do so, be sure to save your work so that it's there when you come back uh, because the, the quiz is going to reset. And uh, you want to be sure that what you've what work you've done before is saved. Now, each of these quizzes have embedded at the end, you notice with our first one, an essay quiz. Well, there was even one of those in our syllabus quiz. Essay quiz questions will be graded based upon the responses that are provided. So I want you to have read thoroughly the course material, and then I want you to maximize the word count. Now, I know that in some cases it's 50 to 100. I want you to move closer to the 100 range, and I want you to write, as it asks you to do in your own words, what you understand in response to that particular essay question. For example, uh, the one in the week two uh, quiz uh, was concerning the um, concept of utilitarianism. Most of you did pretty well. Uh, there was some indication that perhaps there was some fuzziness or confusion there. Maybe in one or two isolated cases, the appearance that maybe the uh, course readings were not read before taking the quiz. So be sure to do that and work to maximize your word count. Let's consider 50 words or whatever the minimum is, the floor. Let's consider 100 more the ceiling. Move toward the ceiling, okay? Unless otherwise designated, uh, it's probably going to be about 100 words. You want to be able to be substantive enough to demonstrate that you understand the concept and can interact with it proficiently. So keep that in mind moving forward with future essay questions that are a part of the readings quizzes. And I also want you to take note that the quizzes are open book and open note. And with each question, there is a reference given to where the possible answer for that question is going to be found in the readings materials. So if you do your homework well and you read, and remember, there's no time limit, uh, so you can take your time, you should be able to um, find the answer uh, or remember the answer from what you had read and know where to locate it and in which source so that you can do well on those quizzes. So take advantage of that open note, open book practice. It's there for your benefit. Be sure to take good advantage of that. Um, now, when it comes to written assignments, most of you have begun working. Many of you have already submitted uh, the week two short written essay that we've been working on uh, concerning the Grise scenario. But I wanted to provide a little more detail and clarity there. Written assignments will be graded with comments provided. 
So whether you turned it in in a Microsoft Word document or a PDF formatted document, I will convert it to an MS Word document so that I can provide you comments. Be sure to take time to go back to your paper, not just look at the grade, but go into the document that I upload for you that's amended with the, comp with the comments. As you go into the gradebook area, you're going to see that link for the upgraded uh, document. Be sure to go in and read those comments. Make the appropriate adjustments moving forward. I'm doing my best to pro provide you good feedback. Uh, we've got some strong writers, and then we have some that are still developing their skills. Formatting and documentation can be bits of issues at times as well. I'm trying to provide you some good feedback there. I want to also clarify concerning the word count. In the papers essay one that we're completing now or have completed in week two, the next one that's coming up a bit later uh, in week five, uh, these two are going to be 500 to 700 words. That word count applies to the main body of the paper only. Uh, now, I provided some uh, latitude if that was not understood, and I want to make that clear. I provided that in our first written essay. Uh, but front matter, that is your name, the course number, the course name, uh, the date, and, and that kind of stuff is not included in the word count, nor is your citations or reference page. Just the main body of the paper, your introduction, the paragraphs, the use of uh, any of the uh, sources that you're using as documented support for your argument, whether it's inline support or footnoted uh, uh, formatted documentation, that's the body of uh, the paper that is going to be within that word range. Uh, if you're using Microsoft Word, and many of you are, you can use the editing tools to check your word count. Just highlight the main body of your paper and then click on the word count uh, tab and it will show you what that word count is and then you can make adjustments where necessary. We want the papers to be robust and substantive, but we don't want them to be so long that they turn into uh, a thesis or certainly a dissertation. That's not what we're about here. Now, the final paper that comes at the end of the course, it's a bit longer. It's 900 to 1,200 words. We'll talk more in detail when that time comes. But once again, that's talking about the main body of the paper, not your front matter, not your citations or reference page. Keep that in mind. Also, when it comes to our written assignments, always provide a descriptive creative title for our written essays. Don't just put paper two. Um, some of you, and I understand why you did this, you simply titled your paper Moral Reasoning. I tried to provide you feedback there uh, so that you can hit the mark on what I'm looking for in a descriptive creative title. For example, I suggested to some of you uh, in providing comments on week two's short written essay that that short creative descriptive title could be something like based on the topic you were addressing is it ever permissible or okay to cheat, right? That's a descriptive creative title that includes the subject matter of the paper in the title, not just paper two or assignment two. Those are not uh, titles. Those are descriptions of the assignment, but they are not titles. So every one of our papers is to have a descriptive creative title. I provided feedback based on the um, a chosen formatting style. Uh, there were cases where uh, double spacing is required, but it was not provided. And I want you to check those rules. Once again, I want to remind you that you can go to the um, um, Student uh, Creative Writing Center um, that's available to you online. And you can see there the various formatting styles and you can check their rules based upon the one you're using. Uh, whether it's MLA, APA, Chicago Manual of Style, or perhaps even Turabian. So I want to help you along that line. Be sure to read the comments that I provide to you in your paper and pick those up and apply those to upcoming short written essays. We've got another one coming up in week five. So I want you to be aware of that moving forward, okay? Uh, our grading will tighten up a bit based upon you picking up those suggestions 
and then applying them in future assignments. If you have any other questions about either the readings quizzes or the written assignments, be sure to feel free to contact me, contact me by email and we'll chat more about those things. Now, I wanted to take a few moments to return to some of the themes and, and uh, terms and concepts we were addressing coming out of week two. Uh, you read from Thomas Aquinas directly. Uh, you read from another author uh, that was addressing some of the views of Thomas Aquinas. And this is important when it comes to the distinction of what we call moral law from the laws of nature. You've seen this little chart, if you've been watching closely, this popped up in week two last week, and I wanted to take a little bit of time with you on this. Thomas Aquinas, who was a 12th century bishop, uh, very influential both philosophically and theologically in helping us understand uh, the moral natural law, referred to uh, the supreme wisdom or God's wise plan that governs the universe which exists within the mind of God himself. That is, God is the source of all that is right and all that is wrong. He refers to that, Aquinas refers to that as the eternal law. So the umbrella under which everything else we're talking about from Thomas Aquinas's perspective is referred to as eternal law. The supreme wisdom or God's wise plan that governs the universe, which exists within the mind of God himself. That's the eternal law. Under that umbrella are two broader categories. Looking at my screen on the left, there's what's known as the laws of nature, according to Aquinas. Those uh, refer to the fixed order by which God commands all of nature. Um, um, now, a footnote there for us is, these are nonetheless not laws in the strictest sense, but only by analogy, because there's no freedom to disobey. The law of gravity, for example, uh, is constant. It's static. It never changes. It doesn't have a will of its own. Uh, metaphysically, the law of gravity can be violated, but it cannot be changed. If someone were to step off a second-story building, the law of gravity is going to take over. One is going to fall clear to the ground and hopefully not be injured or worse yet, take their life, right? Some examples of the laws of nature are, as I've just mentioned, the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, the very nature physiologically that we possess, the laws of thermodynamics, you know, these, these concepts of what a body that stays in motion, uh, that uh, uh, stays in motion or begins in motion stays in motion, a body in motion stays in motion, a body at rest stays at rest, and the laws of gravitation, I just mentioned those. Those are fixed. They do not change. They are what they are. By contrast, Aquinas, C.S. Lewis does this as well in Mere Christianity that we were reading last week, um, distinguishes the laws of nature from the moral law. Now, Aqu um, uh, C.S. Lewis, rather, uses the phrases moral law and natural law interchangeably. Thomas Aquinas separates them. He refers to natural law and divine law under the heading of moral law. Moral law are the divine rules of right and wrong governing man's free choice. So God's still very much sovereign. This is his, his eternal law uh, that is in effect, but it's working not from a static uh, and cannot be changed uh, nature like the laws of nature, creation, but within the human being, there is this free moral agency that we possess, the freedom of will to choose to do what is right or to choose not to, to choose to do what is wrong or to choose to refrain from doing what is wrong. Aquinas distinguishes two of them. One he refers to as natural law, also the moral law. C.S. Lewis refers to it as that as well. This is the law in us by nature, which is written on the hearts of human beings. 
Paul makes reference to this, the apostle in Romans chapter 2. God has written the law on our hearts. There is this innate sense of right and wrong that we carry around with us. It doesn't have to be religious in nature, although many times it can, and it should be when it comes under the law of God, the eternal law of God and his sovereignty, but we know what right is and what wrong is, even separate from religion or the teaching of scripture. Um, the preamble to the Constitution, our Bill of Rights, talks about human beings having certain, notice this, unalienable rights. In other words, they are self-evident. As human beings, we have the right, among other things, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, our founding fathers said. They're obvious to everyone. These belong to us because we are human, right? They're self-evident in their nature, right? Natural law, there's a sense of what's right, there's a sense of what's wrong. We carry it around with us. Remember last week in our reading from uh, 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 C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he said there are two things that are true. One, uh, human beings have a knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. And two, we don't follow them. We don't do them. So there is natural law, according to Aquinas. Um, C.S. Lewis would also refer to it as moral law. And then according to Aquinas, there is what he calls divine law, also called God's law, which is given to man by God himself and recorded in Holy Scripture. This is going to include the Ten Commandments, what we refer to as Decalogue reasoning, the morality that God has embedded in the revealed uh, mandate to first Israel, and because they continue for all people everywhere at all times— like we looked at last week in our readings, they apply to us as well. The moral principles that are involved, the sense of ought and ought not, should and should not, the sense of right and wrong that's embedded in those Ten Commandments, um, they are divine in nature. They're very specific. God has made very clear. He has revealed what his divine law is. And then, of course, flowing out of both natural law and divine law, according to Aquinas, is what he refers to as first human law and other social norms. These are the rules of right and wrong that human beings impose upon ourselves. Uh, these can every, be everything from a sense of respect for ourselves and others, a sense of chivalry, that is, doing the... Um, um, the respectful thing toward other human beings, particularly of the opposite sex, right? And these are qualified by the reality that if human beings uh, are conforming to God's order, human law and norms should also reflect the natural and the divine law. Uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, right? Matthew 7 and verse 12, what we refer to as the golden rule taught by Jesus, right? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? These start to become self-evident practices of right and wrong uh, that are a part of how we govern ourselves or should and how we relate to and govern community, those around us and our relationships to one another. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to cover that just so we can be clear. Um, in some of the essays that were coming in last week, uh, it wasn't as precise as perhaps it could be. Uh, and I wanted to provide a little bit of clarity there, what we're meaning when we refer to human, uh, or excuse me, moral natural law, and what we refer to as Decalogue reasoning or divine law. And those are terms that are used by both Aquinas and then, like we said, um, uh, C.S. Lewis, as we were reading last week. Thomas Beckwith was one that was writing concerning the teachings of um, um, Thomas Aquinas on these very matters as well, coming out of, of last week. You may remember that. So I wanted to go just a little um, bit um, deeper for Aquinas, eternal law is identical to the mind of God as seen by God himself. It can be called law because God stands to the universe which he creates as a ruler does to a community which he rules. 
Aquinas asserts when God's reason is considered as it is understood by God himself, uh, such as it is unchanging, its eternal nature, so forth, it is eternal law. God is the umbrella over all uh, morality that governs our behavior, right? And then there is what Aquinas refers to as divine law. It's a bit more precise and specific because it's been revealed and recorded in what we call scripture or the Bible. Divine law is derived from eternal law as it appears historically to humans, especially through revelation, such as when it appears to human beings as divine commands. Divine law is divided into the old law and the new law, Aquinas says. The old and new law roughly corresponding to the old and new testaments of the Bible. So when Aquinas speaks of the old law, he's thinking mainly of the Ten Commandments. When he speaks of the new law, he's speaking of the teachings of Jesus. And if you'll recall, Jesus said that concerning the moral law, he did not come to supplant it or to abolish it, but to fulfill it. He lived God's moral law perfectly. By the way, he also um, um, lived out perfectly the ceremonial law that required perfect sacrifices for the atonement of sin. Um, so I thought those were important. So here it is again. Uh, laws of nature, the moral law, natural law, divine law, all under the umbrella of what Aquinas refers to as eternal law. Now, this coming week, here in week three, we're going to put a sharper uh, point on this moral law concept um, in the Decalogue, that is the commandments. And we're going to start looking at what are known as perfect duties as, com as a compared or contrasted with imperfect duties. And we're going to be looking at perfect duties as those obligations morally that we have to always do the right thing regardless of any other circumstances because the perfect law the moral law does not change in those circumstances right uh there are positive and negative duties that we're going to be looking at uh positive duties such as love god love your neighbor a summary that jesus gave of the of the great commands right um, and other positive duties, according to the Decalogue, such as keep the keep the Sabbath holy, honor your father and mother. And then there are negative duties as well. The should nots. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. Don't misuse or take the name of the Lord in vain. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet, right? So there are perfect duties. And then by contrast, there are what are known as imperfect duties. An imperfect duty is an obligation that we should work to observe or practice, but it may vary based upon circumstances. Uh, now, it's not utilitarianism as we studied last week, but by comparative obligation, it yields or defers to the perfect duty. I'm going to give you an example here. Um, talked about positive duties, negative duties, what one must should, what one should or must not do, positive duties, what one should or must do. See where we're going here? Um, those things that are always right or always wrong are moral absolutes. Perfect duties are obligations that are always in place, no matter what the situation might be. Imperfect duties are duties that do not produce the same obligation for everyone in every circumstance. Here's an example. Now, you see uh, the posting of the sign, no swimming by the lake, right? That would be, from a moral law perspective, a uh, perfect moral duty. Except when, when you look to the right and you find someone drowning, the obligation to save or preserve life supersedes the obligation to the negative duty to not swim in this particular lake. Do you see? The positive duty, preserve life, supersedes the negative duty, no swimming.
As you read this week, this is hopefully going to become a bit more clear, but I wanted to provide some preemptive summary here because this all has to do with what's coming up in our week three work. We're going to have our first dialogue post this week. Um, you can go through the community board and you can go to the groups and you'll find there these assignments where you're going to be interacting with one another. Let me just take a moment and uh, stop sharing this screen and let me go backward and um, if I can get out of my slides here, I want to go back and share another screen. This might take me a moment to do. What I'm trying to do here, yeah, here we go. I'm trying to go back to where I can show you the um, assignment prompt for our group dialogue. Uh, hopefully you're seeing this on your screen uh, as I share it here. Let me come back over here and share the screen once more. And this is what I want to share with you. Uh, this is the assignment prompt for our dialogue. We're going to be uh, just talking with one another on this particular prompt. A British court in 2019 ruled that a mentally disabled woman must have an abortion, even though the order was against both the woman's wishes and her parents' wishes. Here's what you're going to discuss. Would the parents be morally justified in defying the authority of the court? Is the principle, quote, respect authority a perfect duty based upon the definition and explanation that we gave earlier here and what you're going to read, or is it imperfect? In what ways is the duty to obey a court order and the parent's responsibility both to their daughter and to God related to justice? We're going to read about justice this week. Joseph Pfeiffer is going to talk with us about the limits of justice and what we mean by moral justice. Uh, these definitions of imperfect and perfect duties are going to be a part of our readings this week. So here's the assignment. You're going to write a dialogue post that provides an answer to the questions above that we've just mentioned. Apply the concepts presented in this, this week's readings to formulate your initial response and your reply to at least one classmate. Initial post must have 250 to 350 words, and the response post, just one response to other classmates, must have 100 to 125 words. You're going to meet the word counts, 250 to 350 on the original, 100 to 125 on your response. Make it substantive and thoughtful. Be sure to answer the questions. Be sure to demonstrate that you understand what's meant by perfect and imperfect duties and what's meant by justice. So I'm going to be looking for your definition and explanation and an application of perfect and imperfect duties and moral justice to this case, this scenario that we're looking at. And I'm going to be looking for that in the original post. So keep all of that in mind. And certainly you want to make it readable. You want to make it error free. If you use um, uh, references, uh, be sure to footnote them in the proper way and cite them. If you use quotations, make them very short so it doesn't take up uh, too much of your word count, particularly in your original post. Um, reach out to me if you have any questions. You go through the community board, you click on the dialogue link, you click on add thread to create a space, put in a title, make your, make your post, your dialogue post, click submit. That makes it available to the rest of the class. And that initial post is due by Wednesday night, end of the day, and um, the uh, response is due by this coming Sunday. So the details are there for that. Let me go back over here. There's more reading that we're going to do. Let me share with you again this slide. Um, go back to our slides here so we can see all of the assignments that are coming. So we've got this dialogue uh, post due by Wednesday, end of day, the response due by Sunday. You've got the details. We're going to be discussing key terms and concepts like justice, perfect and imperfect duties, positive and negative duties. And because we're going to start reading in uh, Philip Reich in chapter eight, uh, respecting authority, we're going to talk about, we're going to study this week what it, what it means to uh, adhere to civil authority 
as opposed to the supreme authority God? Uh, are, are there moral absolutes that supersede the legal authorities? And there certainly are. We're going to be looking at the principle embedded in the fifth command, honor your father and mother. As I mentioned, we're going to read from Joseph Pfeiffer. He's going to help us understand the nature of justice from a moral perspective. And I'm excited for you to read this. This is going to be a good reading, just an excerpt from the late Dr. Martin Luther King in his now famous and watershed letter from a Birmingham jail in which he discusses uh, perfect and imperfect duties and moral justice. I think you're going to benefit from that. And then there's an article that we're going to be reading that defines and explains perfect and imperfect duties. So there you go. That's week three. I'm going to be joining you online a bit later in the week. Uh, I'll be staying in touch with you by communication uh, posts of announcements. I'm still going to be grading uh, the remaining uh, week two essays and uh, week two readings quizzes, and I'm nearby if you need anything at all. And so um, I'm excited for what we're going to continue to experience in our course, and I'm ready to help you in any way that I possibly can. God bless you as we continue and open week three.